for any number of reasons. I'm going to follow a good biblical example today of Jesus who sat down and began to teach them because that's about the best I can do today. Uh, now, we are in John chapter 11. For those of you who are first timers, we uh, have been working our way through the gospel, John. I appreciate Jimmy Smith the last two weeks preaching while I've been away. And it was really tough for me to give up John chapter 10 because that's the good shepherd chapter. And man, I love, I love that image. I love that story. And I'll just mention this to you. You know, my daughter and I uh, ended up because she got involved in animal science at Allen High School. And then she, she somehow suckered me into raising a sheep with her. Uh, just so, you, just so you know, in case you weren't sure about this, when the Bible says, we are the sheep of his pasture, that is not in any shape a compliment. <laughs> sheep is one of the dumbest animals I have ever crossed paths with, and uh, I'm glad God is a good shepherd, and he doesn't just bang us between the eyes on a regular basis with his staff. That would have been my sermon from John chapter 10, so you're probably glad Jimmy did it instead. Now, today, John chapter 11, and I want you to open your Bible, whether it's a, you're doing this from, a, from some kind of pad or a phone or your paper copy or use one of the pew Bibles, but I, I want to encourage you to keep your Bible open because we're going to read a few verses, we're going to talk about them, we'll read a few more, we'll talk about them, and, and so you need to keep your Bible open throughout. This, John chapter 11, is one of the most moving accounts in, in all of the Bible. And it tells the story of a good friend of Jesus named Lazarus, and he dies. And Jesus steps into this moment of severe grief and loss with these two sisters, Mary and Martha. And he is so close to them. And he's going to teach us a lot, not only about working through our own grief and losses of life, but also how we step into those situations as we care for the people around us. So there's a whole lot to be gathered up from this message. Now, we hear plenty of talk about time management, people management, uh, money management, all kinds of management, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about grief management. And... In our culture, this is really different than maybe previous generations, but we like to separate ourselves, compartmentalize our lives so that we're not exposed to grief very often. Grief is over there somewhere. It's not in, we don't want to talk about it, we don't want to think about it, and we're not good at it. And we find ourselves woefully unprepared for the losses of life. There is no shortage, by the way, of loss. We, grieve, we talk about grief often in terms of somebody we love dies. There's a lot of other kinds of grief for, for us. And goodness, in, in this crowd here today, I mean, I, I know so many of your stories, and we've been doing this together for a long time, many of us, and, and we, we grieve the loss of a change in our health. We grieve the loss of a job. We grieve the loss of financial position. We, we, there are a lot of things that we grieve as a church family, and <laughs> this is my encouraging word to you today. Uh, as prophet of doom, you have some losses coming your way. If you weren't sure about that, you can just count on this. You have some loss coming your way, and so do I, because that's the nature of life. As long as we're taking breath, we know there are some things that are just going to go away, and there's going to be a grief process that goes with things that are close to us, things that we care about. So it's important that in that kind of environment, we're going to have to enroll in a good grief management course. And I say a good grief management course because clearly from the Bible, there's some that aren't good. Here's what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He said, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. He's talking about those who have died. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. There are different ways to approach grief, to approach the losses of life. And what Paul says is, and some of them aren't that hot. Some of them don't work out all that well. So if you're going to do this, you need to do it well. You need to be in the right approach to dealing with your losses, dealing with grief, because some are not helpful. Some are not hope-filled, and others really are. So we want to get this, get this nailed down. The Bible, and while we'll talk about this in a lot of ways, because the story deals with death, 
We'll use that because that's a, that's a big sweeping issue for us. In fact, the Bible talks about death. It says the last enemy to be conquered is death. Now you're going you're to knock down a lot of enemies before you get to death. But death, the last enemy to be conquered, the Bible says, is death. So we're going to put our focus on that in John chapter 11. And a lot of families in our church, goodness gracious, this has been 2018. Uh, this has been a rough year for a lot of us. A lot of us have lost somebody close to us that we loved. And that's true in family. It's true with our friends. Uh, death has come close to just a whole lot of people. I've, I've preached uh, 10 funerals the first four months of this year. Uh, only one of those was, was for my wife's father, Rhonda's dad. Uh, the rest, all right here, and all people I was close to. I mean, it, it was tough to help the families. It was tough for me because of my relationship with those who, uh, who died. And so the needs, the hurts, the feelings of grief are deep, do not go away easily. Now, I want to remind you of some things. As you face grief, or as you, and there, are two, there are two tracks we're running on here. As you face grief, and as you walk through life with the people who do. Because we see Jesus doing both of those things. He's such a great example in everything, especially when we're dealing with, with death. The Bible says, this is Isaiah writing eight centuries before Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we see that lived out in his ministry day to day. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said, For we do not have a high priest, referring to Jesus, the great high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So here's the thing. If you have not known grief in recent days, you will at some time. If it's not you, it's somebody you know. And in your circles of influence, the people you know, I'm talking about your family, your friends, your neighbors, people you work with, they're going to go through a time of grief, and you need to know what to do and how to do it, how to step into those situations in a grace-filled way. And so Jesus gives us a great example on how to do that as he steps into a situation of tremendous grief with some dear friends in a place called Bethany. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, boy, it's like you need a drum roll with that. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. John's giving us a little context there. Whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, they, they send word, Jesus is off somewhere else. Lord, we, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death for it's for the glory of God that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Interesting. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, there's no question, he loves them, but when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. Now, Jesus had a close relationship with his family. From the gospel accounts, we learn that Jesus spent a great deal of time with them. Uh, today, if you go to Jerusalem, there are hotels everywhere because the tourist trade is the biggest industry in Israel. But... Back in those days, there weren't hotels on every corner. You needed to know somebody in the Jerusalem area that you could stay with. And a lot of people were just really gracious, even with strangers, to open their homes. There are three big feast days. You knew that you were going to have a lot of people coming to Jerusalem for the big feast days. And sometimes just, just coming to visit. Well, here's, here's Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they're in Bethany. It's just, just on the edge of Jerusalem. It's a place where Jesus and his disciples, it's the regular stop. He just had, they, they threw the door open and said, you know, you are always welcome here. The ministry of hospitality is a powerful ministry, powerful for Jesus and his close disciples during these days. And so here they go, Bethany. Now, it was only natural that here's Lazarus is desperately sick that they would want to send word. Oh, my goodness, Jesus is going to want to know about this. And they found somebody who could make a run to where Jesus was and say, you got to know Lazarus is sick, and if you can come, we need you to come. Now, they live in a town called Bethany. Whenever you find that, there are a lot of place names in the New Testament that start 
with B-E-T-H. And every time you see it, it means something significant. It means house of. So if you have Bethlehem, or uh, unless I've been in Israel with a, a Jewish tour guide, Bethlehem, like your cat coughing up a furball, Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem means house of bread. If you're in Bethel, means house of God. And if you're in Beth Ani, it means house of affliction. Man, you know, what's your zip code? Well, some people say, I think I live in the house of affliction. That's kind of been my journey for a while. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's an event, and sometimes it's a journey, but house of affliction comes our way, and that's just the nature of life in a broken world where sin has so damaged things that sometimes we get caught up in the brokenness of it. And we're all going to spend some time in the house of affliction. Now, we hate this in our culture. As an American culture, we just think we ought to be able to shield ourselves from all things bad. If we spend enough money and enough energy, we can always be safe. We can always avoid pain. We, can, if, if we, we have so many doctors and so many hospitals. So we're going to pour our money into security devices and we're going to pour money into health in our health care. And we're going to do all kinds of wellness programs to keep from ever getting sick. And if we do enough of that, we're just never going to feel the house of affliction coming upon us. But truth is, it's going to find its way to us no matter what our efforts. And it's going to break through our door. And so, these two sisters, why? Why, why didn't Jesus do something? Verses 4 through 7 are some of the most complicated verses in the world for me, to, for me to lay my own head and heart around. But also, they're hard for me to explain to other people when why is the big question. So here is Jesus and <laughs> principle number one. We've got several of these for you, just observations as we work our way through. Principle number one, God has a will, a plan, and a timing for our lives. God has a will... Uh, a plan and a timing for our lives. Jesus deliberately waited. When he knew there was a need, he waited to go to Bethany. God is working this great plan. It's going to fit into the big sweeping mission of the Savior. We're going to see that played out as uh, what happens in chapter 11 just fast tracks everything that's going to lead to the cross. And we see what Jesus did here having such a tremendous impact. But did Mary and Martha say, Oh, this is awesome. We're part of God's great plan. No. So, and most of us in, in the moment of affliction, in the times of loss, we don't say, well, this is great. I l cut me another piece of this pie. This is awesome. Oh, it hurts. And it's dark. And it's difficult. And they didn't understand, why didn't Jesus come when we called? The same is true for us. We, we can read a passage like Romans 8, 28. We know that, by the way, I love this sound. You hear the squeals? We have preschoolers in the big stroller. There's a whole gang of them. They love the echo chamber that is the rotunda. And when they discover the sound that it makes, it lights them up like Christmas out there. So, boy, it's a, I love kids at church. And anyway, they crack me up because it makes them very happy. Truth be told, some days when I'm here by myself during the day, I go in there and do the same thing. <laughs> Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. But when you encounter the death of somebody you love, somebody close to you, it doesn't feel good. And God's working it together for good, but it's not good. It hurts, and it feels dark, and you feel a a alone. And you see God's purpose displayed always, and He's always working a great plan. And sometimes, I mean, I've we've had people who, this year, I, d I did one memorial service, and uh, I know th this is such a tragedy. However, I know that it's going to fill our building with people far from God who will have the opportunity maybe for the first time in their life to hear the gospel. 
And I can immediately connect a dot that I can't explain all of why a terrible thing happened, but I can see this, that God's at work. All things are working together for good to those who love God who are called according to His purpose. And I can draw a line. And sometimes over years I can look back at a tragic situation and say, I can see what God did. I never would have imagined, but now I see how He took a crisis situation and He he wove this tapestry of glory that uh, is just amazing. And most things, this side of heaven, I'm just going to have a big question mark hanging over a lot of things that have happened in my life and around my life. And, and when I talk to other people in your lives, I, 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 can't, I can't draw that quick and easy line of here's why God does what he does. But one thing you can count on in the process of grief, Jesus will come. He will come to you as clearly with as much reality as he came to Mary and Martha in their time of grief. And he comes close and he's the only one that's going to, he's the only one that gives meaning to life. And he's sure enough the only one that can give any meaning to death when we experience death. And that's why we look to him because he is the only. Now, verse 17, down to verse 24. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Well, she's pretty hope-filled in the middle of great grief. When Jesus and his disciples arrived at Bethany, Lazarus, he's already been dead for four days. And what we know about burial customs of the day is that they probably buried him the day he died. They would have wrapped him in grave clothes and put him in a tomb and seal the tomb. There'd be probably other, they would use a tomb for a lot of different people. It wasn't a one occupant situation. He is, but he's, he is sealed away in the tomb the day he died. And there was a Jewish superstition that we've learned about that the, the spirit of someone who died would hover around the body for three days, just hoping it could return to the body. Now, that's a superstition. We ran into superstition when we talked about the Pool of Bethesda. There's a guy who's been there 38 years, and there's a legend, a superstition, that when the, when the waters stir, if you were the first one in the water, you'd get healed. And Jesus uh, rebuked that superstition, too. So when it comes to the end of life, when it comes to death, uh, we have a lot of shallow, superstitious kind of views about it. Uh, Jesus waits till day four. So even the superstitious people can't assign this to anything but Jesus. He's going to eliminate the foolishness of superstition to focus on the truth of God and the power that was his as the son of God, even to raise the dead. So we find Martha. She is true to her nature. She's busy taking... We hear the story also from John. She's always taking care of everything. She's taking care of the details. She's the one. Her sister Mary, she'll sit and just listen to Jesus teach and worship, worshipful heart always. That just the wiring of two sisters it's being so different. Martha, she's taking care of business. And in working through her grief, I see Martha taking care of business. As soon as she hears Jesus is there, she runs out to meet him. She's probably also playing hostess to all these people who've come to grieve with them. She's probably serving, make sure everyone has enough food. That's just how she's wired. And when Jesus arrived, she went out to meet him, grateful for his presence. And Jesus didn't say to Martha in her loss, Sit down, Martha. I'd like to preach a sermon to you about grief. I think, I think he, he, he just listened to her. And she, and she, cause she needed to express, Lord, if you had only been here. He let her talk. He let her grieve. He listened to her. And this is what I want you to get out of second, second key thing in this story. Presence is powerful ministry. Uh, we usually, we, we, some of you have, oh my goodness, someone, someone I know and love has died. And 
and you get there and maybe you go to visitation at the funeral home or at a memorial service or it's at a hospital and you're the first one there and you want to say something but you don't know what to say so you you say something dumb it just happens and we we want to oh there's a crisis and we well you know all things work together for good to those who love God or called according to his purpose well why don't you just take off your shoe and hit them with it it would have felt as good it would have been as purposeful it doesn't mean that's not true, but there's a time for that conversation, but it's not in the moment of crisis. In the moment of crisis, you just tell people you love them. You pray for them in, in that moment, you're, but you're present with them in, in the time of grief. And, and so many of you do that so very well. Uh, we tend to provide overly simplistic answers. Well, you know, this happened, but at least they're not suffering anymore. Well, you know, it's... That's true maybe, but it still doesn't feel that good in the moment. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just be there and, and not offer up a lot of overly simplistic answers to why things happen the way they do. One of the other things is by your presence as a believer in Christ, you represent the visible presence of Christ. You make him tangible to people who feel lost and alone. Now, verse 25. And down to verse 27, Jesus said to her, by the way, she's pretty hopeful. Your brother will rise again. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I know that one of these days it's all going to get fixed. She's not a Sadducee. Remember the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, they're the spirit, spiritual elite, the top tier of the spiritual uh, world. They don't even believe there's, there's anything after death. She's beyond that. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Martha acknowledged her belief. Lazarus, I believe he will rise again on the last day and and Jesus came back and said, I'm not talking about some distant doctrine, something way out there in Neverland. I'm, I'm talking about the hope that's ours right now. Uh, there, don't, don't, don't just push back to one of these days, things are going to feel better. When, when Jesus comes into a situation, he's a present reality. He is, this is one of the great I am statements. Remember we talked about there's seven I am statements in John's gospel. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's not the one who one of these days is going to get it all taken care of. He's the right now I am in the present and forevermore. Jesus says, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And in that sentence, it's a, it's a weird construction. It's bad English. It's great Greek New Testament because it's a strong double negative. And what it says is, he shall not never die. Not, never, no, not happening, shall not die. And he's not, but uh, Lazarus died again. He was raised on this day. I should have told you, spoiler alert, because we haven't read that yet. He's going to be raised on this day. Church tradition says he lived about 30 more years and then he died. But the, the great truth, the, the powerful message, the reality of the story is Jesus talking about something bigger than whatever years God gives us? You know, you, you get your, some people have less, some people have more, but you 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever God entrusts to you, uh, as wonderful as a, that long life may be, God's working a plan that's eternal, that's forever and ever. And that life beyond, it's still out there and it's still waiting and it's glorious. And he says, he shall not never die anyone who's placed their faith in Christ has eternal life it's not just some future pie in the sky by and by hope it's a present reality for us Lazarus body died last breath here next breath in eternity he would live forever principle number three we have the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ and man that if you don't get any farther with me than number three that's a good one to stop on we have the hope of eternal life through Jesus. I have, I've done a lot of memorial services over the course of ministry years. 
And I have, I have done a lot of memorial services for families who had no hope. We talked about that passage from Thessalonians. We do not grieve as the rest do who have no hope. I've been at way too many memorial services where it was so dark because I had people in the building who grieved like those who have no hope. They had nowhere to turn, and it is a desperate grief. It's a hopeless grief. Uh, as a follower of Christ, we don't grieve like that. We have a different kind of hope because of a Savior who defeated sin, death, and hell. So, not so with those who know Christ. Verse 28, down to verse 32. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher's here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, when Mary heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. He's still staying back from the crowd that's uh, wrapped around their home. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What's interesting about that to me is, is that exact same thing that Martha said. Like somewhere in the conversation of those days of waiting for Jesus to get there, they must have bounced it back and forth over and over again. If Jesus had been here, it would have been so different. If Jesus had been here, if only Jesus had been here, how different this day would be. Maybe Jesus would have stopped this uh, pathway to, to death, repeated over and over and over again. It's, it's the desperation of grief. And principle number four says, <laughs> the Lord may seem far away in our times of great grief, but the reality is, he is near to us. He cares for us. He's close, and he's working a plan, and we can trust him. Now, verse 33, down to verse 37. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse in the Bible, just two words, verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he open the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? So Jesus was surrounded by people, people he loved and people who were hurting deeply and then in that context, that's where we get that shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And it speaks volumes about the heart of God for us in our times of loss and grief, separation. Principle number five, Jesus shares our sorrows. The, the Bible says we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And Jesus models it. The word for wept here. Jesus wept doesn't mean that uh, he just felt a little sad. It doesn't mean he, you know, he got a little teary. It, it means he burst into tears. There are a couple of times that stand out to me when it says Jesus wept. This is the first one. He burst into tears over, over the death of his friend and the grief situation he steps into with uh, these two Sisters, another time it says Jesus wept. He burst into tears. It's when he weeps over the lostness of people. Think about what, what makes you really burst into tears. What do you grieve over deeply? Uh, what sweeps over you like a storm? And uh, I've been in a, some of you have been in a grief situation. I've been in grief situations where people are grieving around me. And it, just the environment of grief just captures, captures you and uh, moves some things in you. 
And I think about the things we grieve, and I think, oh, you know, we grieve that our favorite team lost. We grieve that our pet died. And those things have some kind of grief attached to them. Well, when's the last time you grieved over the eternal souls of the people around you who entered eternity without Christ? When's the last time that you, you know, I have to ask myself, last time I, I was so deep, I wept over the losses of people. People that I know. People that are neighbors and friends. And people around me. Uh, Jesus wept over important things always. Then verse 38 down to 44. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor. For he's been dead for four days. That's one of the times I really like the King James Version. Have you those of you reading the King James? Lord, by now he stinketh. That's as clear as it gets, right? That takes away the, that puts a little edge back on that. She's always the practical one. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Then he when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I remember I took a, took a class in seminary on uh, Jesus' interactions with people in the Gospels. With uh, My professor was Roy Fish, professor of evangelism. And he said, the reason he said Lazarus come out is because he would have emptied every grave in the world if he'd said it otherwise. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Man. Principle number six, there's some things only God can do. And uh, Jesus said, roll away the stone. Martha, I don't think that's such a good idea. But God has some pretty good ideas when it comes to our grief and our hurts and our losses and we try to manage everything ourselves. When a lot, for a lot of people in grief and loss, they say, uh, I am such a strong person, or I'm going to try to be a strong person. I'm just going to bear my burden. I'm going to fight my way through. I'm going to manage this on my own. And when you face the loss of people you love, when you face death, you're going to get to the end of your resources quickly. And you need something beyond you. And if you look in the right place, you'll find Jesus. He is more than able. But Martha, she's trying to manage grief still. Instead, we should invite God to be at work, to welcome him, to bring the comfort and the grace. And, and if we do, even in our hurt and our loss and our grief, we may just get to see God's glory revealed in ways we never would have anticipated as he proves himself God. Principle number seven, while there's some things only God can do, there's still plenty of things we can do. Jesus performed this incredible miracle. He raised Lazarus from the dead. This is the point where his enemies said, there's only one thing we can do. We're going to have to kill him. This pushed, this pushed the people who wanted to stop Jesus right on over the edge. This is what leads to the cross. He's raising Lazarus from the dead in the shadow of the temple in Jerusalem. This... Uh, this starts moving things. This is a powerful miracle. But in the middle of this, Jesus didn't do everything. I mean, by his spoken word, he's, uh, the passage I shared from Mark's gospel with the children earlier, he, by his spoken word, he calmed the Sea of Galilee in a stormy day. But here, he could have, by his spoken word, said, Lazarus, come out, and the stone flies back, and he comes out, and Jesus walks over and grabs hold of the burial cloth and yanks it off of him, spins him like a top, and he's free. Jesus could have done all those things himself, but he didn't. Because they're just a reminder in loss and grief, there are a lot of things we can do. And a lot of things that he's waiting for us to do, he wants us to engage in. You know, I know that uh, some of you, 
you, you may be kind of on the edge of things with our church. You come, you go, and maybe the only time you really see church is when we're in here together. But for many of the rest of you, and especially those of you who've gone through great crisis and challenges and grief, for me, that's when I'm most proud of our church. And I'm glad you're here today. But what, what brings me great joy in being a part of this community of believers is when, when crisis comes and you kick it in at a high level to be the church and you start doing all those one another's in the Bible. Uh, I, I love that in a moment of great grief, and this is why we, we have those Bible fellowship groups because that's where we do most of our one another's, that and if, if you're just doing church by coming in here and saying, okay, it's all about just singing some songs and, and, and hearing a, a sermon and then going home, man, you, you've just barely got a taste of what church is because the church is us doing the one another's together, and especially in crisis times. And I don't know how many times I've been called because somebody died, and I jump in my car and I head to a house, and when I get there, that house is full, full of people from this church who are caring and praying and taking care of the practical things. They're rolling away stones and they're taking off grave clothes. They're doing the practical things. They're bringing a meal. They're mowing a yard. They're cleaning the house. They're doing whatever needs to be done for the church to care for its people. And that's why you need to really dig in and be a part of the church at a high level because of those things. How many times I have been to hospitals in uh, Collin County, Dallas. I make a lot of hospital visits. There's a crisis. It's bad. And I jump in my car and I head down there and I get down there and then I find myself in this negotiation with medical staff. No, see, I'm, I'm the pastor. I, I know that the room has been full of people from our church all day, but I'm, I'm the pastor. Oh, uh, they've already had plenty of visits already. They don't need anybody else. But I'm the pastor. But because people from this church have dug in. How many times I've been to hospitals and I see waiting rooms full of people from this church who are wrapped around a family. Because that's what the church does. And, and, and don't stop short of being the church and of digging into the, that level of church. Because that's when the church is, uh, is a triumphant place. At the end of the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, we learn about what heaven is going to be like. And one of the things that's going to be missing is grief and loss, death. This is how it's described. It's talking about Jesus. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning or crying or pain anymore. And why is this true? It's true not just because Jesus said so, but because of who Jesus is. See, everything's tied to the character of Jesus, to who Jesus is. And that makes everything else flow. In the first chapter of the Revelation, Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades, death and hell. I hold all these things in my hands. You have that kind of hope in Jesus Christ today? The kind of hope that's going to carry you through anything? Are you willing to put your faith and trust in Jesus who wept victorious over sin and death and the grave? You know, one of my favorite verses in John's gospel I read a moment ago, and we, we just touched on it. That was verse 25, 26. Jesus said, Again, one of the great I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And that great question. By the way, if you've been in a memorial service with me uh, where it's a believer that we're, we're remembering, I'm just about always going to share those two verses. And I'm going to ask the question Jesus asked. Do you believe this? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And you need to believe it too. It's one of the great promises of Scripture. Notice how Jesus covers all the fears of our lives with these wonderful words. There are two groups of, two groups of believers that are mentioned here. 
So we got two categories. One, you got people who already died, yet shall they live. Uh, I've told you before, and I'm, I'm old enough now, I know more people there than I know here. I know a lot of people in heaven. Heaven's going to be a really familiar place for me uh, because I know a lot of believers who died. And that gives me great hope. Great hope because of people I know and love that I know they were here and now they are there and it, it changes how I grieve because I know they're well taken care of. There's a second group of believers that are that are pointed out here and it's the ones that are still alive. This is, a, this is us in the building. Most of you are still alive. Some of you are kind of borderline. But it's, it's those of us who are believers. And there's, unless Jesus comes in our lifetime, we're all going to face the end of life. And, and, and it's this hope that we have that I am not afraid because I know Jesus. I have put my faith in him. I'm one of those people who has believed. And there is no darkness. There's no loneliness. There's no separation. There's no limitation. Uh, and when I pass from this life, I will immediately uh, be be with the Lord. Uh, one of my one of my favorite quotes. I'm reading a book, and I'm I'm well through it, uh, three fourths of the way probably now. It's called Fifty Christians, Fifty Famous Christians Every Christian Should Know, uh, and that's probably a butchering of that title, but that's basically the idea. So it's a lot of church history people, and uh, one of them is D. L. Moody, and uh, like kind of like mini biographies of these famous people. And why you ought to know something about them. And, D.L. Moody has this great quote. It's one of my favorites ever. He, he said, One day you will hear that D.L. Moody of Northfield, Massachusetts is dead. Don't you believe it? In that day, I will be more alive than I have ever been before. There's a perspective of hope in Jesus Christ. In the resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, he actually lays down a little taunting of the grim, re grim reaper, a little trash talking of the grim reaper of death. He says, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Death, you got nothing. It's all gone. It's all covered. The victory is ours in Christ. Now, I want you to notice one more thing. We're closing out. Two times in this context, Jesus lays down a condition believe. He says it twice. Believe. Believe. And I'm sorry to say, and so, the scripture holds forth no hope for those who do not believe in Jesus. Jesus declared here. He declared in John 14. It, we'll, we'll look at it in a couple of weeks. He declared over and over again. The Bible is so clear on this. In a, in a world that so believes in universalism that somehow everybody, regardless of what they believe or if they don't believe at all, are going to go to heaven. The Bible holds out nothing of that. You are making up a religion to believe that. And this is not me being hard and harsh. This is what Jesus said. There's only one way to have this hope. There's only one way to have this hope even when you face death, when you face the death of people you love. You know, if you will believe... If, if you will put your faith that Jesus is the one and only Savior who gave his life at the cross to pay for sin, who, who was raised from the dead, and if you will surrender your life to him, uh, there is hope. Hope beyond anything this life throws at us. But without, there is nothing ahead but darkness. And that's, that's why we have to believe. And that's why I'm going to keep telling you that over and over and over again. Because I don't ever assume because you're in church there's ever been a time when you really made that transaction with God by faith. As an, accepting the grace that he offers to us. This is the gospel story. I know too many people who don't know Jesus. They need to believe. They need to trust him. And that's why our church goes out. And that's why we tell and that's why we want to be a lighthouse in this dark world. And that's true if it's here. It's true if it's in Bethlehem. It's true if it's in Hungary where we're looking at a mission trip in the fall. Wherever it is, we're going to tell people about Jesus. And there are a lot of things we can do in our community and we do to care for people. There's a lot of things we can do in the world and we do a lot in our world to care for the needs of people. But if we're just making people's lives more comfortable on their way to hell, we're not really being the church. 
We want them to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, believing they would have life in his name because that is our great hope.